Well, good morning. Let me invite you. We'll just take a moment to everybody find their seats. And if there's any in the, uh, in the hallway, they, there's still some room. But there's also overflow in the back room as well. So, well, we welcome each of you here this morning. My name is Jim Twilliger, pastor at North Marine Fellowship. I was pastor here at uh, Bethany Church along with Rob for many years, as well as uh, a few other people that are here. Actually, we've got the whole row of pastors right over there. So Pastor's Row, they call it. <laughs> but we are, we are blessed to be a part of this service as we come and we celebrate, remember the wonderful life of Bonnie Clausen. I know that Rob and his entire family want to thank each of you and they probably will personally, but as many as you, they want to thank you for coming and for your support, not just today, but for the past months and literally the past years that I know all of you have been a part of this journey and of this family. You know, as followers of Jesus, it is appropriate to mourn. And today we will mourn, but we will also rejoice. We mourn our temporary loss. Did you hear that word, temporary? That temporary loss of Bonnie, but we rejoice at her reward and her gain of being with the Lord. And think about this, all of the promises that are being fulfilled for her even now. As we begin this special time together, will you pray with me? Lord, we come to you this morning to remember and celebrate Bonnie's life and all that she means to us. We do come to you with heavy hearts of mourning and sadness and ask that you would be with us to comfort us even as we comfort one another. But we also come before you with rejoicing, knowing that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. And we thank you for Bonnie's life and faithfulness to you and to so many others in the life that you gave her. May this morning and even as we move into the afternoon bring glory to you and also honor to your child and faithful servant, Bonnie. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I've been asked to read a, a eulogy for Bonnie, about Bonnie, and just some of the things that surrounded her life. Bonnie Bennett was born on February 13th, 1964. She was the youngest of six children. And she, and they're all here. Wow. Praise God. And she lived a happy childhood under the care of Jim and Lee Bennett. The Bennetts lived near Mount Tabor in southeast Portland. And Bonnie often shared great memories of playing in the neighborhood with the neighborhood kids on Stevens Street. I'm sure the siblings remember that. While attending Franklin High School, she also was able to be involved with a youth group at Mount Tabor Presbyterian Church. This is when Bonnie committed her life to following Jesus, along with many of her friends and youth group friends. Bonnie started preparing for a career in nursing after high school. She also got involved with Mountain Park Church. This is where Bonnie and Rob first met in 1984. For Rob, he says, it was love at first sight when he saw Bonnie in the youth room one afternoon. Bonnie never claimed to love at first sight. But she was pretty happy as their relationship quickly grew. Bonnie and Rob were married in August of 1985. It was the hottest day of the year that day, and the church building was not air-conditioned, <laughs> thus leaving great memories of them. And like many of us, maybe they were financially broke but happy as they started their marriage together. While working as a dental assistant, Bonnie also excelled as a full-time student at OHSU School of Nursing. After graduation, they packed up their belongings and moved to Southern California so that Rob could attend seminary. Bonnie worked full-time as an RN at Huntington Hospital in Pasadena, where she also gave birth to her first son, Nick, in March of 1990. Rob writes this, Some thought we were crazy, but Bonnie wanted to be a missionary. And so we prepared and raised financial support headed to Costa Rica. Some of Bonnie's favorite memories happened in that year at Costa Rica. We would talk about it all the time. We were assigned to uh, join a new team working in a large city in central Mexico. 
Having a young child made ministry a challenge, but Bonnie did a lot of creative things, like teaching first aid, leading an English class, and helping out in various churches in the city. There are more memories and adventures of Mexico than we could ever share in one city. A big highlight was the birth of our second son, Andrew, in the May of 1993. Our very blonde Mexican boy was quite the novelty. <laughs> if you've ever been to Mexico, you know what I'm talking about. But after four years as missionaries, we expected to continue in Mexico for many more years. But we had a calling and agreed to accept the invitation to be a worship and outreach pastor right here at Bethany Church. Bonnie was pregnant again with our third son, DJ, and we decided to move back to Oregon where he was born in June of 1995. Bonnie was a great mom to which her sons would confirm. She decided to homeschool the boys while also working part-time at Salud Medical Center in Woodburn. She had so much love and energy to give. Starting Two Rivers Church in 2005 was a very exciting adventure for our whole family, and Bonnie was super involved in her own way. Bonnie didn't like being up front, but she shined behind the scenes as she loved on people. With a true servant's heart, she modeled Jesus' life to love others more than herself. Bonnie also loved to run. As a matter of fact, she ran with my wife, Melanie, for many years. She was always in good physical shape. She was rarely sick until 2006, when her appendix burst and she had emergency surgery. We were scared, of course, but the doctors assured us that she'd be fine. But as most, if not all of you know, Bonnie wasn't fine. A year later, feeling really bad, she went to the doctor and went then to the oncologist, and they believed that she had advanced ovarian cancer. The blow to all of us, especially our family and our young Two Rivers Church congregation, seemed insurmountable at times. Bonnie fought hard for many years. Countless surgeries, constant infections, lots of prayers, lots of medications became her new normal. But she continued to take care of her family, especially her two new granddaughters, Eleanor and Eden. She worked when she could, ministered to our church members. While often in pain, she would still love and serve others, to which many of you were recipients of that. There's so much more that we could share about Bonnie, but you know, that be, you know that because you're here, ready to celebrate and remember her life. We believe with all of our hearts what the Bible says, that is to be absent from the physical body is to be present with the Lord. While we mourn and grieve her loss here on earth, it's hopeful, almost fun at times, to think about her new complete life in eternity. Well done, good and faithful servant. At this time, we're going to have a couple songs that we would like you to sing along with. They're going to be on the screen, and the music will be, there's not somebody up here leading, so you need to lead yourselves. Most of you know these songs, the love of God and the goodness of God. So let's sing that first one together, the love of God. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell.
Rob has asked for two scriptures to be read, uh, one from Psalm 117 and the other from Revelation 21. First Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. And then in Revelation um, chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. My name is Jeff Kramer, and it's been my great honor and pleasure to uh, be friends with Rob and Bonnie for over 40 years. And then as their family grew, to uh, be friends with the whole family. And um, Bonnie enjoyed Psalm 30. And uh, I think it's appropriate on this day of celebration to read these verses. They, they say a lot about her and about her relationship with the Lord. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name which we did this morning. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I, cr I cried for mercy. What is gained if I'm silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. And you turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. It says a lot about Bonnie, doesn't it? Those of us that know her. It was January of 1984, and I was a freshman in college. I was attending and part of the college career group at Mountain Park Church. And um, on Super Bowl Sunday, for some reason, the church decided to hold a retreat at the coast for volunteer leaders, college, high school, junior high leaders. Interesting choice of time, but we went. And because of my commitments uh, on Friday with classes and some other things, I couldn't go with most of the rest of the group who left Friday afternoon. But the, the, the youth pastor uh, helped me connect with a young lady who was driving up a little bit late. And uh, so 
Bonnie Bennett and I drove to the coast together. And I had met Bonnie before, but I never had any sort of conversation with her. This was our first chance to really kind of get to know each other. And I, I wish I could say that I remember a lot of details about our conversation, I, I really don't. But the one thing I do remember very clearly was that um, as we got to the coast range, um, we were getting ready to go up one of those hills. And we both noticed that there were a number of cars parked on the side of the road at the base of the hill. And we kind of looked at each other and said, what's, what's going on? I, I don't know. Well, about a minute later, we found out why as we hit a patch of ice. And we started to slide into the oncoming lane of traffic. Now, there were no other cars coming, but it was still pretty scary. And uh, I think that Bonnie took her foot off the accelerator and we started slowing down, but we were still s sliding and skidding. I was no uh, master driver. I, I didn't have a lot of driving skills. I knew enough, though, that if you go into a skid, you want to like turn into it so you can get control of the car back, and then you can you know hopefully you know take some direction. And so when Bonnie said to me, "What am I supposed to do?" I said, "Well, you need to turn just slightly to the left." And before I could say anything else, she gave me this look of, "What are you kidding?" <laughs> turned the steering wheel to the right, which put us into a 180 spin. <laughs> and at least we got out of the oncoming lane of traffic, but as we moved to the right, slowly moving towards the shoulder, fortunately, we landed on the shoulder, completely off the road, but about a foot and a half away from a very steep drop into the woods. And we both took a deep, just breath, and it wasn't but a minute later that a gravel truck started coming up the hill, followed by the procession of cars that had been parked at the base. They, they, were, waiting, they were waiting for them to get the road ready to go. So and Bonnie immediately, she just she turned the car around, got into line behind the cars, and we made our way to the coast and the retreat without any further issues. That was my introduction, introduction to Bonnie. And over the years, as we've kind of laughed about that story and... I didn't have the time, at the time, I didn't reflect on this, really. But in the years since, I've, I've, I've recognized that I saw a lot of her character in just those few minutes. First of all, I, I saw her courage. Um, when the gravel truck and the other cars started going by, she immediately was like, as soon as she could, get into and, and take off. I'm not sure I could have been able to do that. <laughs> I'm not sure I could have conquered my fear quite that quickly, but, but she did. She, she is a very courageous woman. I saw that when she packed up and left the safety and beauty of Oregon to move to Southern California, <laughs> where I was living at the time as well, so. But also the courage to, to leave the United States, to go to Central America to follow the call that she knew that God had given to her and to Rob. And then, of course, these last years to see her courage in fighting cancer and her health. Bonnie is so courageous. And it was good for me to be able to see that and to recognize that, that and the, or to recognize that now, even though I may not have been able to see that at the time. But also, I saw her selflessness. Because as we came to the side of the road and you know, took that deep sigh, her first words were, are you OK? We had just met, really, but she was still thinking about me. And that selflessness, <laughs> that defines, that's, that's so much a part of her character. The love that she expressed for, for her family Oh, she loved her family. She loves her family. She loves her friends, her co-workers, those that she ministered to and gave um, in her nursing profession, was able to give help and aid to. Bonnie is a lover of people. And I'm so glad I got to see that, not just that day, but so many times in these years since. And of course, her love for Jesus. Oh, how she loves Jesus. 
And that's the, 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 the fact that we are able to do any celebrating today is because of that love for Jesus. The, the reason I can celebrate is because I know that as a follower of Jesus, she is with Jesus. And because she's with Jesus, she has been healed. She's been set free from pain and suffering. And I know that I will see her again someday because I too am a follower of Jesus. And all of us who follow Jesus and have received his gift of forgiveness, we have that hope, right? Those are the words that we've been reading and talking about and singing about today, that hope that we too will get to be with Jesus and we will see our sister Bonnie and we will get to tell her how much we love her. That's what we look forward to. I hope that's, 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 that's comforting to me. I, I grieve. Oh, I miss my friend so much. But it's, it's comforting to know that she's with Jesus. And I hope that that's comforting for you too. Thanks for letting me share this a little bit of, of just my reminiscing and just remembering her character because uh, she lives. She lives. Nick's going to come up and, and, and share a few things right now. Thanks, Jeff. Hi, everyone. It is so good to see everyone. There have been so many people to say hi to, and I hope I get the chance to do it with everyone. But through so many different phases of life, I was showing Eleanor some of the people and like, oh, this is how this person knew your grandma. This is how this person knew your grandma. So the first thing I want to say is just thank you to everyone on behalf of myself, my brothers, my dad, the whole family. We are so grateful. And I know that not everyone could be here, so I also want to make sure that for those who are watching online, thank you. We feel your presence here, and we are so grateful that you're still able to join us. And it brings me so much joy to look around the room and to know there are so many people that my mom has impacted in positive ways. And I'm glad that we can be here to celebrate. My mom was the best mom I could have ever asked for. I couldn't imagine a better mom. She raised three boys, each with very different personalities, very different learning styles, and had to figure out how to homeschool each of those different learning styles. We all had different interests, all had different hobbies, and we all had different energy levels. Somehow she did it. Um, the story that I, I really like to think of is living in Hubbard, we lived about a um, really short walk, a block or two away from a park that had a nice big open field. We frequented that park um, because that's where you go to take boys to get their energy out. Uh, and there was one specific day where I think we each had our idea of what to do at the park and what fun at the park would look like for us. So my mom just said, fine, we'll do it all. And so she packed us up along with a soccer ball, a frisbee, baseball and mitts, uh, lacrosse sticks and a ball. And I'm sure there were other things I'm forgetting too. I think we had a whole tote of things that we took. And eventually it even turned into us being in a circle each with a different implement of sporting goods, passing it then to the next person. So you had to hold the mitt, catch the frisbee, kick the ball, and it went around the circle like that. <laughs> Most special to me personally was um, the times that she would spend talking to me, usually past my bedtime, um, and I'm, I'm, most of you probably know this, but I am an external processor, and I've been known to be a little bit verbose at times. So bless my mom's heart that 
Maybe it was in the kitchen after dishes had been done, or it was even on the hot tub in the back porch in the snow. No matter what, she would sit, she would listen, she would offer advice, she would validate the things that she wanted to see grow in me. She would encourage me to explore for myself and to learn on my own, but do it in a very loving and guiding way. And then um, we weren't always sure what her health would look like, but I am so grateful for the time that we got to have with her, and especially that, um, she, that the Lord kept her with us long enough that I got to see this whole new side of my mom as ladies began to enter the family. So un until I got married, <laughs> I had no idea that my mom was interested in certain things like, <laughs> like thrift store shopping, knitting, baking, and gardening, among many other things, all kinds of crafts and things like that. One of the biggest things that I am so thankful for is that my mom was able to be a big part of my daughter's life for five years. She watched her pretty much every Tuesday for about five years, being one of our main sources of daycare and being one of the best friends to Eleanor. I think that through that time frame, we brought home at least a dozen Ziploc bags full of homemade glitter slime. <laughs> this past month has been really hard to, to understate. But being able to go through all of the photos, being able to talk to people, going through memories, um, I've really found myself reflecting even more and more on the person that my mom was. And even more than that, knowing that she wants us to carry on the legacy that she's left. So I thought of three specific character traits. You can tell I grew up in the church because there's three. Um, that were intrinsic to my mom's character. <laughs> And I think they're things that each and every one of us would recognize in her and also agree it's worth continuing on that legacy. So the first one, and as Jeff mentioned, th this is the first one I came up with too, Jeff. Um, but many of you saw this firsthand, and that was that my mom was selfless. She became a nurse so that she could heal others. She became a missionary so that she could shine light to people who were less fortunate than her. She homeschooled her sons, taught Spanish classes. She led women's ministries. And all of that so that she could help other people realize their full potential. She had a hard time saying no. But it's not because of a sense of duty or a sense of guilt she would feel if she did say no, but it was just because the people around her were more important to her than her own wants. We live in a world that tries to draw lines between people, between groups of people, between different beliefs, and it tells you that in so doing, you really can't trust anyone but yourself. But I would rather be like my mom, doing things for the people around me, whether or not I agree with them. And oftentimes, that is not the easiest option. But if I look at my mom's example and my mom's character, I know that she never regretted being that way. Second, my mom always looked for joy whether it was dance parties in the living room to Gloria Stefan, the countless hours of cooking and cleaning for family or church or others, serious talks with people who were going through hard times, finding ways to entertain toddlers, 
or even just sitting down and watching Young Frankenstein or The Great British Bake Off. <laughs> My mom found joy in all those things, and even more. I think she had a very special blend of curiosity, creativity, and positivity. The first Bible verse that my mom and dad taught me was 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. Still got it. My mom not only taught me that principle through scripture and through making me memorize the scripture, but also I saw her live that out. Thanks to her, I learned that you can never learn too much. And that there, there is so much in this world that is worth learning about and exploring. I've learned that you can infuse creativity and find joy in just about everything. I mean, I work as a data analyst, for crying out loud. But I enjoy that. I find the opportunities to be creative, to be engaged in that, to learn new things. And as a result, I really like the work that I do. And I have my mom to th thank for showing me how to have that attitude. Finally, and most importantly, my mom was kind. And that's a really big word, and there's a lot that encompasses that. Some of the other words I thought of was she was gentle, she was compassionate, she was empathetic, and she was loving. Rarely were the words out of her mouth something negative. And oftentimes, they were even encouraging in an attempt to uplift someone. She empathized with people who were hurting. But she was also someone you could turn to for down-to-earth wisdom when needed. And I think, I'm going to take a wild guess and say that every single person in this room would agree with me in saying that just being around her would make your day feel a little bit brighter. But most of all, though, she wasn't kind in order to make herself feel good. She did it because, again, she believed that the people around her, that other people, were worth showing kindness to. More than any other aspect of my mom's legacy, that's what I want to pass on. I want to pass on her kindness. I want to see people, all people, as worth showing kindness to, just as she did. And most importantly, I think, is I don't want to do that so that I can feel good about it or so that someone can owe me something later on. I want to do it just for the sake of making someone else's day a bit brighter. My mom has left an incredible legacy. And I can look through the room and see it. I have, I have the memories. I can think of specific examples. And I know you all can, too. And so my hope is that today we celebrate her legacy and we look for ways to continue living that out in the world. Let's keep it going. And I, I guess the one last thing just to encourage you all with is um, after the service here, we'll have a time of potluck, time to just hang out and talk. Um, and I know a lot of people have memories they want to share, and so we want to give you guys the opportunity to do that. And so either at the table where you can eat or kind of on one of the side tables there, you'll find pieces of paper and pens. And please, write down a memory. Write down a way that she showed you these traits, that she has passed her legacy on to you. And then we've got little ribbons over kind of by that main doors there that you'll see. Please pin it and go through and read everyone else's and remember and let that be the way that we can all share, remember, and pass on her legacy together today. I'm going to pass it over to Jenny Jones now.
it's incredible to be incredibly encouraging to be in the room with Bonnie's nation today. <laughs> I just, it's just a sea of people who love Bonnie, and I can't think of some place I would rather be. My name is Jenny Jones, and I had the incredible blessing and joy of knowing Bonnie as a mentor, a sister in Christ, and a friend for 20 years. Bonnie's life verse is Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. I'd like to begin by sharing those words with you. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I first met Bonnie in the fall of 2004 when my husband Mike and I were invited by Rob uh, to come here in this building to a Saturday night Bible study. It was uh, a fall Bible study, and it was um, sponsored by this group of people that had decided they wanted to plant a church in the Milwaukee Oak Grove area. Mike and I thought, well, gee, Saturday night's our TV night. We've got these shows we don't want to miss, but we could skip them for three months. We never watched those shows again. I don't even remember what they were. <laughs> we committed instead to joining the church planning team, and we never left. Um, when Two Rivers Church opened its doors the following February, soon after a women's retreat was announced, I signed up. I was really nervous about attending. I didn't even know what they did at women's retreats. I'd never been to one. And I knew the names of women in church, but I didn't know them know them. Didn't yet feel like I knew them personally. But I went, and I noticed Bonnie the very first evening I arrived. She smiled and waved at me from across the room. But I still just knew Bonnie as the pastor's wife. We hadn't moved beyond polite conversation yet. She, on the other hand, I noticed knew everyone. Now, I, later I realized it's because Bethany had planted North Marion Fellowship and Two Rivers and all three churches were there. But I was pretty impressed that she just seemed to know everyone. So it really surprised me at one of the meal times when she just came. I was sitting alone at a table and she just plopped down in front of me and set her lunch tray down. And, and I started to get a little nervous. I didn't know how to act around the pastor's wife yet. <laughs> and if I had any preconceived notions of how I should be acting, they went out the window while uh, making direct eye contact with me. She reached across and stole the Hershey bar off my tray. <laughs> Two things I learned about Bonnie that day remain true over all of the years that I knew her. She had a wonderful, playful, mischievous sense of humor, and she purposefully came alongside others, hoping to encourage them as they ran their race of faith. I want to honor first Bonnie's sense of humor. So Bonnie was in charge of games <laughs> at all the Two Rivers Women's Retreats. And honestly, I really wish I could have brought a slideshow of the pictures of what she did to us um, <laughs> at those game times. But the reason we have a private women's Facebook page <laughs> is because no one will ever see those pictures. She would show up with that little innocent Bonnie smile and her box of tricks. And the next thing we knew, we were strapping tissue boxes full of ping pong balls to our behinds, <laughs> pulling stockings over our head with an orange in the toe, and swinging them wildly <laughs> around the room at each other, knocking objects over. Everyone except for Bonnie, that is. <laughs> we would invite her to play her games, and she would say, I'm the game facilitator. Then there was the year she told the retreat planning committee she was simply going to lead us in a nice time of Mad Libs. And if you knew Bonnie, Bonnie loved Mad Libs. So I didn't think anything of it. 
I should have been suspicious something was up. I learned shortly after the game time began that the Mad Lib was a story she wrote about me, and I was told to sit in the middle of the room. And Bonnie then proceeded to pass out to everyone else in the room bubbles, cans of smelly Glade air freshener, squirt guns full, and plates of pound cake. There were certain props, prompts in the story, and when these words were spoken, these items were either sprayed at me, on me, or launched in my direction. <laughs> I recall the retreat center had put in new carpet that year. <laughs> so some of the women were on their hands and knees crawling and trying to pick up chunks of pound cake that were flying through the air. <laughs> but not Bonnie, she was facilitating. <laughs> She taught us how to play Mennonite manners. She was fiercely competitive as a game player. And um, what I remember about Mennonite manners was that her manners were not there when she played it. If you've ever played the game, when it's your turn for the pencil, you have to lunge across the table. And I had st stabby pokey marks up and down my arm. She'd rather stab you than let you get her pencil. What pure joy she was, is. Laughing with her was my first invitation to friendship with Bonnie. I also want to honor Bonnie, the encourager. She purposefully, while running her own race, came alongside me and lingered, encouraging me, keeping pace with me, letting me know I could do it as I ran. Bonnie could have sat and shared a meal with anyone at that retreat, that day, she knew everyone, but she chose to take the time to get to know me. It would be my first of many meals with Bonnie. In fact, I've sat and thought, how many times did she take the time to meet with me? I, co I couldn't count. I couldn't even begin to count. Our meeting place was Sherry's in the Milwaukee Marketplace Mall, so we could watch the ducks through the window. When we would <laughs> leave, she'd always quack at them uh, and make faces at them. We would split a stack of pancakes, we would share herbal, herbal teas and coffee, and we would sit for hours and talk about Jesus and the Christian life and service to others and, and family and church. And afterwards, we would walk to her car and she would pray over me. And then as I grew in my faith, when we walked to her car, I'd pray over her too. She encouraged me to begin serving in the church um, but it was more than just an ask. Bonnie never really let me go. She, would, she was a mother hen. <laughs> At first it was, Jenny, can you bake cookies and can you serve coffee? And then eventually it was, can you serve in the nursery? And then uh, one day I came to serve in the nursery and she'd removed me from the nursery schedule, which I know is some of your dreams. <laughs> but <laughs> I was worried. I was worried I did something wrong. And she said, no, I, I have another place I want you to serve. As Bonnie endured a terminal cancer diagnosis and pain and medications and countless surgeries and recoveries, she encouraged me to serve and to stretch myself in new ways, asking me to write and produce skits for women's retreats, um, encouraging me as I served and asking me to come alongside her as she served. I remember one season she had noticed we had this gaggle of tween girls in our church that didn't yet, they weren't old enough yet for the youth group. And so she said, Jenny, let's start a Bible study with them. So we gathered them all up and we started one of many Bible studies and we held overnights in the church for them. We watched horrible movies, painted nails, got no sleep. <laughs> And we shared the gospel of Jesus with them. I'll never forget the Sunday, standing across from Bonnie, we got to lower three of them into the baptism waters. Bonnie also encouraged me in my own personal growth and maturity. One memory stands out in particular. I had attended a Bible study she had led, and it was deep and very convicting. And I saw changes I needed to make in my life. And so she said, Jenny, I want you to write a letter to God. I want you to talk to him about what you want him to change in you. And, um, and then bring it to the last class. So I brought it to the last class, and she took it, and she said, I'm going to hold on to it for a decade, and I'll give it back to you. And I thought about that letter so many times. 
going, I have made these commitments. I need to keep praying about them. And she committed to me in that moment, in that little moment, saying, I'm still going to be here in 10 years, girl, and I'm still going to have your letter. And she did. She brought it to me at the last women's retreat we were at together. Bonnie showed me what it looked like to encourage others in their race of faith. And then she nudged me out of my comfort zone, asking me to go and do the same. Instead of just attending her study, she started making me lead occasionally. And she fed me books, which encouraged me to reach for others. And she put me in roles that demanded that I reach for others. After teaching a short message to a group of young girls one day, she pulled me aside and she said, Jenny, I think you have the gift of teaching. And whether I believed that or not, when she spoke those words to me, she believed it for me and she never stopped encouraging me to open the word of God and to share it at every opportunity. And every time I stood to teach, if Bonnie was in the room, I would look at her first because she always did this. always. She encouraged and nudged me from serving coffee and cookies to teaching the Word of God for the last 13 years. I remember the day I realized it. I know that sounds crazy, but sometimes you're just living life and you just don't see things so clearly. But I was at a retreat with her, and the teacher was talking about um, how some people have the gift of encouragement and, and what they do <laughs> when they have that gift. And I went, oh, Bonnie, that's been what Bonnie's been doing for me for years. So God gave me such a gift and that I actually got to go and tell her, I see it. I see what you did for me. I see you. And, and hold her and cry with her. And then I remember she said, Jenny, I'm just telling you, I'm just doing what he's telling me to do. But there was no only in what she did. She knew her time was limited. Yet she took the time, that precious limited time she had, and she poured it into others just like Jesus, just like him. And I am not the same person because she listened and she obeyed, and that is just my story. I am one, one voice. That's what's truly incredible about Bonnie's life. With terminal cancer, she guided our children's ministry and our women's ministry for well over a decade before passing the baton, but she still remained involved and she still served. All while nursing, and as everybody said, homeschooling, raising kids, being the wife of a pastor, that's a full-time job. And she did so while taking the time to encourage and challenge and mentor so many. And she had the cancer diagnosis. She could have stopped reaching. She could have stopped encouraging. She could have stopped serving. And no one would have blamed her, right? No one would have even questioned her decision because she had that cancer diagnosis. But she didn't. And we need to look at that. Why? Why did she just keep serving? Because she knew what Jesus endured for her. She knew he'd given everything, all of himself on the cross of suffering for her. Bonnie understood that when someone gives their life for you, it demands your response. It demands it. She believed that part of what Jesus had suffered on that cross was for her personally, to free her from the curse of sin, from eternal death. And believing all these things, she responded by fixing her eyes on what Jesus endured for her. She understood suffering, so she never forgot the one who suffered for her. Bonnie responded to his sacrifice for her by putting all her faith and trust in his promises to her, knowing that they were not just words in a book, but promises Jesus had died to fulfill. She followed his example, and she poured out in service to others to say, thank you, Jesus. I honor you. This word in Bonnie's life verse, race, let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. It's the word agone. We get agony from that word. 
Our race of faith is agony. It, it, it's, Andrew knows this, it's a long distance, sweaty, achy, muscle blistering in your shoes race of agony. It's a struggle, but it's the right kind of struggle. It's the kind Jesus modeled to us. And because Bonnie believed in all that Jesus did for her, her struggle, her agony, it has ended forever. Forever. She is receiving the gift of eternal life in his presence right now. She is more alive now in heaven than she could have ever been alive here on earth. Praise the Lord. I've shared with you Bonnie's life first. I want just a couple minutes to share with you her favorite short story. Um, it was written by Max Salcedo and published in his book, God Came Near. The story is called Lime Climber, sorry, Limb Climber, <laughs> or Branch Sitter. And Bonnie shared with me on multiple occasions with much emotion that this was the story which inspired her to say yes to her role on the team of people that planted Two Rivers Church. Yes, to leaving Bethany and going out into the unknown. In this story, the author uses the metaphor, and if you can see this picture, there's a neat example of it. The metaphor of a thick, reliable, strong, low branch on a tree to describe the comfortable branch sitting life of faith. The author then describes how Joseph, who was betrothed to Mary, was sitting on that wide, low branch, imagining a nice, comfortable life when he found out Mary was pregnant with the promised Messiah. The Savior sent to rescue and redeem the world from its captivity to sin, and God was calling Joseph to leave his plans behind, to leave that nice, wide, low, comfortable branch trusting instead in God's plan that he could not see. God was calling him to leave the safety of what he knew, to climb up into one of the higher limbs, to be the father of Jesus, the provider for Mary and Jesus, and their protector. And Joseph was initially not really totally on board with this. What would life look like? What would that cost me? Joseph knew in his mind's eye what the life he had hoped for looked like, and that was the life he wanted. Isn't that true for all of us? Isn't that what we want, what we imagine? From his favorite spot near a trunk, he could imagine a different life, and it looked good to him. He didn't know why anyone would want to climb any higher into those untested branches that look so risky. What happens if a storm comes, he wondered. There's no protection from the weather and those spindly branches. Common sense told Joseph not to climb. Convenience told him not to climb. His own self-will told him not to climb. He longed for the low, wide, branch-sitting life. But Joseph was called to climb, and in obedience, he responded to the call. He left the comfortable branch, and he became a limb climber. Jesus also responded to the call, and in obedience, he left all comfort he had known, and he became a limb climber, and knowing the cross, he hung on a tree for all of humanity. And Bonnie Clausen recognized in this story her desire for living the branch sitter life. We all have that in us. We all long for the life we imagine, but Bonnie heard the call of every Christ follower, and having no way to fully know what was ahead or the many powerful storms that would come, she fixed her eyes on Jesus and in obedience she climbed. And when Bonnie retired last December, the women of Two Rivers gave her this sketch of a young girl reaching for the first branch because we wanted her to know, Bonnie, we saw you climbing. We saw you climb so high. We were honored to have a front row seat watching her climb in those spindly branches following after Jesus. After one particularly hard season with cancer and multiple strokes, I asked Bonnie a question I'd long to ask her. Bonnie, do you know why God has not healed you? Why has he allowed the cancer? And she didn't even hesitate. She responded, I think it's about his glory, Jenny. 
Bonnie's hope was that in her weakness, his power would be made more visible. And if you're sitting here today and Bonnie Clausen came alongside of you for a stretch of your race of faith and encouraged you, would you please stand? Look at what our God can do through a woman who had cancer for a third of her life because she surrendered her will in obedience for his. Now, give him all the glory. Give him all the glory because that's all Bonnie wanted. Thank you. I'm supposed to announce something. <laughs> Sorry. And now Bonnie's kids and grandkids have a video to share from a favorite book of hers that she always read to them. A mother held her new baby and very slowly rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she held him, she sang, I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The baby grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was two years old and he ran all around the house. He pulled all the books off the shelves. He pulled all the food out of the refrigerator and he took his mother's watch and flushed it down the toilet. Sometimes his mother would say, this kid is driving me crazy. But at nighttime, when that two-year-old was quiet, she opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, looked up over the side of his bed, and if he was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. While she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The little boy grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was nine years old and he never wanted to come in for dinner. He never wanted to take a bath. And when grandma visited, he always said bad words. Sometimes his mother wanted to sell him to the zoo. But at nighttime, when he was asleep, the mother quietly opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of the bed. If he was really asleep, she picked up that nine-year-old boy and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby, you'll be. The boy grew, he grew, and he grew, and he grew. He grew until he was a teenager. He had strange friends, and he wore strange clothes, and he listened to strange music. Sometimes the mother felt like she was in a zoo. But at nighttime, when that teenager was asleep, the mother opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of the bed. If he really was asleep, she picked up that great big boy and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. While she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I am living, my baby you'll be. That teenager grew, he grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was a grown-up man. He left home and got a house across town. But sometimes on dark nights, the mother got into her car and drove across town. If all the lights in her son's house were out, she opened his bedroom window, crawled across the floor, and looked over the side of his bed. If that great big man was really asleep, she picked him up 
and rock him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Well, that mother, she got older. She got older and older and older. One day, she called up her son and said, You'd better come see me because I'm very old and sick. So her son came to see her. When he came in the door, she tried to sing the song. She sang, I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. But she couldn't finish because she was too old and sick. The son went to his mother. He picked her up and rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And he sang this song. I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my mommy you'll be. When the sun came home that night, he stood for a long time at the top of the stairs. Then he went into the room where his very new baby daughter was sleeping. He picked her up in his arms and very slowly rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while he rocked her, he sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Well, I'm Pastor Larry, and I've had the high privilege for a lot of years to know this family, and it's been one of the, the great highlights of my ministry life to know Rob and Bonnie and the boys, and just thankful that I can be here today. I know you've been here a while, and every, I noticed some of you being church people, that old crud, the pastor's getting up now. <laughs> So I will make a commitment that I will keep it short. I, I do count it a high privilege when Rob asked me to share a devotional, and I, I prayed over it to say, you know, what, I, what else can I say <laughs> than what's already been said, Nick and all that. Um, but I'd like to bring you a perspective that God seemed to give to me um, if you don't know the history, years ago, we were looking for a worship person to help us. And so we went over to George Fox College and met some prospective people, and one of them was Rob. And I remember saying, would you come help us? And uh, he did. And I'm going to be a little bit prejudiced right now, but I think one of the best worship guys I've ever worked with is Rob Clausen. And I went into our old directory. It's so old that Noah brought it over on the ark. <laughs> but, but Rob and Bonnie and the two boys are in there. And I looked at that and I saw Bonnie's face and it brought back so many mem memories. And uh, <clears throat> you know, what made her so unique? And you've, you've heard about it, I, I couldn't add anything to it, but one of the things that I love are people that have a, a sense of humor and the ability to joke around. And Bonnie was one of that. You know, it's kind of hard to find those people in the born-again crowd. I've struggled anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> and some of you here know the story that I injured myself and had a wound in my leg and uh, it wasn't healing and so I would come to church on Sunday morning and I never forget out here in the gathering place 
Bonnie would say, get over here. Okay. And she said, let me look at it. And it wasn't healing. And she said something about I was going to get gangrene and my leg, my leg was going to fall off. And then she questioned my IQ. <laughs> and I, I, gave, I gave her a name. I'm not going to repeat it here, because some of you will be injured if I told you. But I love that. And I'd go up and I'd say, Bonnie, you need to work on your bedside manner. You know, I, and we would laugh, and it's those memories that I have. Uh, but then I thought about Bonnie, and I thought, what, what really made her special? There were so many things. And I thought about today around the world, I get it every week, sometimes daily, about things going on in our world with missionaries, and that they are being arrested uh, jailed and even martyred. And some years ago, there was a speaker asked this question. If you were arrested for being a follower of Jesus Christ, is there enough evidence to convict you? So what I'd like to do today is present some of that evidence. You've heard it already. But as I think about it, I thought, so how, how can we bring evidence Eyewitness. So what I did, I asked six people that I knew, knew Bonnie well, and I said, would you send me a verse that reminded you of Bonnie? And so here's the list. Judy Clausen, 2 Timothy 4, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith, now there's in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to those who have longed for his appearing. Wayne Clausen, Proverbs 31, 28, her children will rise up and call her blessed. Guess what we got to hear this morning? Her husband also, and he praises her. Ellis Moiser, Hebrews 12, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before us endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Luanna Moiser, I took you from the ends of the earth, Isaiah 49, from its very corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you, I have not rejected you. So do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Pastor Jim Twilliger, Romans 5, 3 and 5. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that the suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he's given. Mel Twilliger, it's curious that this passage was quoted tw twice in what people thought. She's clothed with strength, Proverbs 31, and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up, here it is again, and call her blessed. Her husband also, he pray praises her. So, I picked a, a passage now, how many, when you thought of Bonnie, wept when you heard the news? You can raise your hand. Yeah, I've wept a lot, folks. So I hope I can get, get through this passage. It's one of my most meaningful passages, I think. And it's at the tomb when Mary Magdalene comes. Uh, and if you know the story, uh, they've come, the, the tomb is there, she's come back tomb's empty. She goes back and tells a couple of the disciples, come look, the tomb's empty. And now they come and they look and like being like men, they leave. <laughs> and there's Mary by herself. 
and she's distraught. She's crying. Her heart's broken because she doesn't get it. And then someone's standing there, and she thinks it's the gardener. And then she hears this, Mary. And immediately, she's heard that before. That is Jesus calling her name. And I guess I thought of that a few weeks ago. Bonnie got to hear in heaven, Bonnie, and she knew who it was. Let me close with Bonnie's own words. This, I appreciate Luana sending these to me. As a family, we naturally feel sad and frustrated sometimes, but in general, we are resolved to make this a process that is full of purpose and hope. None of us are immune from having to experience hard things. We don't feel picked on by God. For me, this is about leaning into God for guidance to navigate a really bad, horrible situation. The Bible tells us that we can lean into Jesus because he went through the bad, horrible stuff and didn't give in to hopelessness or anger. Of course, he knew, we do also, that there's hope beyond this life. Let me pray. Thank you, Father. Father, I think a lot of us will, for years to come, remember this service. It's unusual. It's, uh, it's filled with hope. It's uh, had the message loud and clear of, of how to prepare for the next life. And it's all because of the example we had in Bonnie. And I thank you for loving this woman and her loving you. And I thank you for the incredible gifts that you blessed her with. And Father, my biggest prayer now is for Rob and uh, the hole that's left for him and for the boys. And Father, I just pray that, that you will be that gracious one now, day by day, that you are. And we pray that in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. At this time, we want to invite you to stand, and we're going to have one more song in Christ alone to sing, and then after that, I invite Barb Hushka to come and close us in a time of prayer. So let's...
Our precious Heavenly Father, we are so honored to have known your Bonnie. We're so honored to have had those joyful times with her, laughing and being able to be together just as friends. And those of us who've got to walk through our daily lives together, our raising of kids and watching parents get older. Lord, we thank you for the times. I thank you for the times of prayer and opportunity to be together, to listen to her, care more about what's happening in our lives than what was happening in hers. Then when I asked her how she was, she would brush it away to talk about the weightier matters of her family, of the boys, just one more milestone. Can I be there when they graduate? Will I know my daughters in law? And I want to thank you in the middle of it for Annie, for Mish, for Eleanor, for Eden. I thank you that she was here and she was fully here. I think about, Lord, how she knit in prayer and with her daily life, with every grid of, every grid on the calendar like a knitting needle, she knit her life with you. And I remember days when she said, I don't know how much longer I can make this, how much longer I can do this. And she'd keep going. And Father, I ask that you would continue to answer those prayers. The prayers for her mama. The prayers for her siblings. The prayers for Rob and Nick and Annie and Eleanor, Andrew and Mish and little Eden and for DJ, and for the women in her Bible study and the people in the lives of those she loved. And Father, I ask that you would cause all of that suffering and prayer to be manifested in the lives of her kids and her grandkids and truly, they would continue to knit with every breath of their life, just like she did. And those of us who've been changed because of her, we would continue to remember that life is short. And the veil between heaven and earth is thin. And above all, we thank you for the gift of Bonnie. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Barb. At this time, I'm going to invite, you can take a seat just for a moment, invite the family. We're going to let the family have, to be able to get out to the gathering place at this time. So family, you guys can head out there and, and uh, just a couple of announcements as they're, as they're leaving. Um, obviously, they want to invite you to stay and we have a potluck lunch and uh, enjoy that time. A lot of, uh, a lot of new uh, and old relationships to uh, to renew, right? And so a great opportunity. Also, just a reminder that, uh, as Nick shared earlier, there are these cards to share a memory that I encourage you to do that. Um, I know maybe some of you brought cards and already did that, but um, if you want to share one of these memories, you can do that. And again, place it. You'll see as you go out on the right, there's a, a little bit of a memorial there that you can put that and, uh, and stick that there on the wall for other people to read as well. So again, thank you so much for coming and uh, as the family leaves, you are dismissed and can join them for uh, a meal. Thank you for coming.